Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel commemorates victims of 9-11. The Israeli Prime Minister comes under fire for making a controversial accusation, and it looks like the Palestinians have canceled local elections. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here with the latest news in Israel. The 15th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks is being commemorated today, and one of the first ceremonies to be held was right here in Israel. American embassy and Israeli officials stood together in Jerusalem this morning in a strong display of solidarity between the two allies and the shared battle against Islamist terror. Those gathered heard the personal testimony of first responders as well as family members of those killed in the 2001 attacks. Five Israelis and 76 Jews were among the nearly 3,000 victims in New York, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania who were murdered by al-Qaeda terrorists. U.S. Ambassador to Israel Dan Shapiro, who was working on Capitol Hill that day and the likely target of Flight 93, expressed gratitude for his survival while referencing the approaching Jewish New Year. On that day, I was at work on Capitol Hill, which we learned later was the likely target of the fourth plane, United Flight 93. Once the passengers and crew understood what was happening and what had already happened on the other doomed flights, they courageously fought back and against all odds managed to steer our nation away from further tragedy. Even as they perished and their families suffered irreparable losses, they saved others. I might have been among those they saved. So in addition to pain and loss and fear, I and so many Americans experienced incredible gratitude. Each year at this memorial, I try to spend a little time with the heroes of Flight 93, whose names are etched on this memorial, to thank them. Others have similar stories of inspiration about first responders, colleagues, ordinary citizens, and later the men and women of our military who served and gave and even died to keep others safe. The bravery and service and spirit that was exhibited through these events continues to inspire us to seize every moment to do and give and serve and build. Today's ceremony was held at the 9-11 Memorial in Jerusalem, which is the only one in the world outside of the U.S., where all of the victims' names are inscribed along with their countries of origin. Today, most of the world is commemorating the victims of the tragic 9-11 attacks, but not everybody knows that the U.S. government is still investigating the devastating events. Just two months ago, a congressional report was published regarding the involvement of Saudi Arabia in the terror attack. Joining us in the studio to shed some light on this is Middle East expert Dr. Mordechai Kedal. Thanks so much for coming in. My pleasure. So, let's begin. What was published in this 28-page report? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to correct you. I'm not sure that the most of the world commemorates those events. I'm at all not sure that mo the Muslim world at large uh, commemorates it. They dis dis disassociate themselves from those events. They claim that Al-Qaeda never represented the Islamic world, especially the, what came out from Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State recently. Definitely they view these acts and those organizations as something which came out from Islam, acted against Islam, not according to the consent of Islam, so they don't want to be, you know, part of it. So uh, uh, this is only one little correction. Now, about the Saudi role, uh, people tend to say that 15 out of 19 people who uh, perpetrated the 9-11 the attacks were Saudis. Uh, it is correct, but they did not act as a messengers of the Saudi uh, regime. On the contrary, they acted against America because America was supporting the Saudi regime. 
they actually acted against the Saudi regime. They were opposition to the Saudi regime. Could be that some Saudis, even in the States, supported them by money, by shelter, by I don't know, other means as well. But definitely, they did not act in favor of Saudi Arabia. Now, when the CIA initially, you know, started launching this investigation, they claimed that Saudi citizens were not involved. What changed? Why are we suddenly seeing all this information come out? Well, they out? were involved, but not as the long hand of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, look, imagine that some uh, Israelis who hate Israel go and kill some others. So where did they act against Israel? They, 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 they acted for Israel? Not at all. They, against, they, they acted against us because they hate us, although they have Israeli citizenship. So this is actually what happened there. They were not serving the, the ruling uh, uh, elite or the ruling family of Saudi Arabia. They were acting actually against them. Uh, of course, uh, things have to be investigated because there were all kinds of uh, signs that some Saudis, even officials, uh, were involved in a way or another with supporting them. Maybe they didn't know what they are and what they prepared to do. Uh, they might uh, needed some, let's say, support, help, charity, whatever, and um, they got, only because they were Saudi citizens. Not necessarily the Saudis knew about their plan and what they are planning to do. Now, why was this report published 15 years after, you know, the attacks took place? Apparently there are some parts which actually show that either the Saudis by reluctance uh, enabled it, or some Saudis, uh, who may be even in official positions in the United States, actually helped them. And this actually will expose the Saudi uh, regime to claims in American courts for taking part in these, uh, in these things. So this might be the reason why this report was not revealed uh, completely, especially the secret part of it. And uh, maybe in the future we'll see it and uh, we'll see what happened. How do you think, you know, this report is going to influence the U.S.'s relationship with Saudi Arabia right now, if at all? Look, could be that the, the cold atmosphere between the United States and Saudi Arabia during the last uh, couple of years uh, are the result of what happened. That some people in the American administration try now to punish uh, the Saudis, either by turning um, a cold uh, shoulder to the Saudis or by supporting, uh, supporting Iran. And the nuclear deal with Iran and the money which was given to the Iranians in cash definitely is uh, against the Saudis, especially now when Iran is fighting Saudi Arabia on the Yemenite soil, on the Iraqi soil, on the Syrian soil, and on the Lebanese soil. So definitely in the competition between Iran, or the struggle, I would say, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, some Americans do support Iran. Interesting. Now, let's talk a little bit about how this is going to influence Israel, if at all. You know, there have been reports that Israel and Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabia are growing closer. Uh, finding out information like this, what kind of impact will that have on Israel? Well, Israel and Saudi Arabia share today at least two things. One is the, is the fear from Iran. Iran threatens Saudi Arabia as they threaten Israel. And uh, I really don't know who will be the first victim to Iran if they actually want to attack. Second thing is the bad feeling about the uh, behavior of the American administration vis-a-vis -vis Israel and vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia. Uh, both states, I think, share the same bad feeling about uh, the attitude of the State Department and the White House to these both countries. And this could be a very good basis for maybe cooperation, but at least understanding between these two countries. I'm not saying that there is uh, hugs and kisses between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, but uh, apparently they have much in common today, much better than they had in past times. Uh, I think when uh, Iran continues to devastate states like Yemen, Iraq, uh, Syria, and potentially uh, Lebanon, Lebanon as well, 
Uh, Israel will feel much more cozy with Saudi Arabia. If the other arenas, in addition to Syria, start to be in flames, and we didn't see the last uh, scenario in, in uh, Jordan as well, who is also uh, is, uh, shaking and shivering to see what happens on its borders, in Iraq, in Syria. Uh, so definitely here uh, we see, I think, with the Saudis in the same eye, many issues. Well, thank you for coming in. My pleasure. And uh, we'll have you back soon. Inshallah. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is making it clear to the world the Palestinians' intention of forming a state without Jews is tantamount to ethnic cleansing. The Prime Minister and his supporters have long rejected allegations that it should be illegal for Israelis to live in the biblical territories of Judea and Samaria, which has been the Jewish heartland for thousands of years. We obviously strongly disagree with the characterization that those who oppose settlement activity or view it as an obstacle to peace are somehow calling for ethnic cleansing of Jews from the West Bank. We believe that using that type of terminology is inappropriate and unhelpful. Settlements are a final status issue that must be resolved in negotiations between the parties. We share the view of every past U.S. administration and the strong consensus of the international community that ongoing settlement activity is an obstacle to peace. The U.S. State Department was quick to take issue with the Israeli leader's terminology. You know, let's be clear. The undisputed fact is that already this year, thousands of settlement units have been advanced for Israelis in the West Bank. Illegal outposts and unauthorized settlement units have been ro retroactively legalized. More West Bank land has been seized for exclusive Israeli use. And there has been a dramatic escalation of demolitions, resulting in over 700 Palestinian structures destroyed, displacing more than 1,000 Palestinians. As we've said many times before, this does raise real questions about Israel's long-term intentions in the West Bank. Most countries view Israeli settlements in the West Bank as illegal and an obstacle to peace. But the Israeli government has consistently rejected these claims, saying the Jewish people have lived in Judea and Samaria for thousands of years. With just 57 days to go until the U.S. presidential elections, we can expect both candidates to turn up their appeals for votes. Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton did her utmost to reach supporters of the Jewish state when she gave the first ever interview by a 2016 presidential nominee to an Israeli network. Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton was the first to give an interview to an Israeli network during the 2016 race. During her interview with a popular Israeli Channel 2 television station, Clinton predictably slammed her Republican contender Donald J. Trump, proving he doesn't know as much as she does about the Middle East. She accused him of not knowing the difference between Hezbollah and Hamas and maintaining an ever-shifting position regarding the Jewish state. Well, it depends on what day he's talking. Uh, he has said that uh, we should be neutral toward Israel on Monday. And then on Tuesday, he has said that, uh, oh, he's really supportive of Israel. On uh, Wednesday, he might say Israel should pay back uh, the uh, defense aid it's received over the years. I, I mean, there is no rhyme, no reason to his uh, comments about Israel. They are ill-informed. Clinton also went to lengths to defend the Iranian nuclear deal, even though it's long been adamantly rejected by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as extremely dangerous. I believe with all my heart that putting a lid on Iran's nuclear weapons program uh, has made Israel safer, mm -hmm. has made the region safer, uh, prevented a nuclear arms race. The fact that we were able to reach an agreement on the nuclear program does not in any way excuse the behavior that Iran is still engaging in. Mm -hmm. I have made it clear that with respect to the agreement, my approach is uh, distrust and verify. Mm -hmm. When asked why she won't use the term war on radical Islam, even though Trump will, Clinton tried to argue that doing so would serve the purposes of radical jihadists. She then cited a recent op-ed in the Time magazine that claims extremist Muslims support her political rival. A, an article just today by Matt Olson, the former director of our national 
Counterterrorism Center makes this point. Mm -hmm. I, I found it even uh, surprising mm -hmm. how clear and compelling the case was where he quoted ISIS spokespeople mm -hmm. uh, rooting for Donald Trump's victory mm -hmm. because Trump has made Islam and Muslims part of his campaign. And basically, Matt Olson argues that the jihadists see this as a great gift. They are saying, oh, please, Allah, make Trump president of America. Mm -hmm. So I'm not interested in giving aid and comfort to their evil ambitions. Mm -hmm. I want to defeat them. I want to end their reign of terror. Wow. I don't want them to feel as though they can be getting more recruits because of our politics. The U.S. elections often hit the headlines in Israel, and Israeli society is divided about who will be a better fit for the Jewish state. While some of Trump's pro-Israel statements have been warmly welcomed by Israelis, other skeptical Israelis tend to side with Clinton's claims. The first presidential debate will be held in just over two weeks on September 26, and almost every Israeli will be watching closely. With a new poll released almost every day both in Israel and the United States, the presidential race is tighter than ever. Just last week, Trump reportedly had the lead, and today it seems like Clinton is back on top. ILTV's Steve Leibowitz sat down with Israeli pollster and political analysis Mitchell Barak, who believes the presidential debates could have a major impact on the final result. Just weeks ago, it seemed as though the U.S. election was pretty much a done deal. Hillary Clinton was way, moving way ahead in the polls, and Donald Trump seemed to be floundering. His campaign was going nowhere. Now the polls are almost even. As a, as a veteran pollster, as an observer of uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, elections, w what's your take on what's going on? Well, I think most of the polls are sh still showing that uh, Hillary Clinton is leading in most places. The issue is in the United States is each state has to be polled separately. The popular vote is not relevant. It's how she's doing in each state. And I think the, the general feeling is in that many of the key states with the big electoral votes and the swing states, she does have some kind of sizable lead. It does seem like Donald Trump is playing somewhat of a catch-up. He is sobering up, if you will, and trying to stay on message. I think he may have to his advantage that many of the people that might be voting for him are not people that would a participate in polls and b might publicly admit that they're voting for him when he causes such divisiveness among the american public might there also be some voters that for example would never want to vote for a woman and they're also not uh, giving their public position and they too might be sort of hidden numbers within the polls it, it might be i think the thing here is this has been a negative campaign so it's negative Clinton attacking Trump, but yet Hillary Clinton is talking about what her policies are, what she intends to do, and her vision for America. And Donald Trump is constantly attacking Hillary Clinton and constantly attacking politicians and other people and getting in uh, verbal arguments and fights and attacks with other people. The problem is, is that he hasn't really shown what his policies are. I Meaning he likes to tell people what he's against and the negativity, which is only good for a certain period of time. It's great in the Republican primary, especially when you have, you know, 18 candidates. It's ba great to be the negative guy, to get all the attention, to be the guy who's, you know, who's going to change everything. But I think the American public wants to know, especially Republicans, and there are a lot of key Republicans that have already, you know, said publicly they're not going to vote for him or they're going to vote for Clinton, or they're just not going to, not going to vote for him. Uh, and that's an issue, and, and I think a lot of the American people who are interested in voting for him, that lean Republican, want to know what does he stand for? What does he stand for? What is his vision for America? Making America great again is a, is a wonderful slogan, but how are you going to accomplish that? How are you going to deal with the economy? How are you going to deal with immigration? He's already kind of flip-flopped on immigration and not, again, given his stance on what he's going to do. How is he going to do these things? How is he going to increase trade? So I think he has to, you know, talk about his vision for the United States. We actually did polling among millennials in the United States, and our polling found that we asked young people between the ages of 18 and 35, what would they like the candidates to focus on? Uh, their vision and experience 
or the dangers of the other candidate. And it was very clear cut. Among more than 80% of both Trump supporters and Clinton supporters said, focus on your experience and what you've done and what you intend to do as president of the United States. Some say that uh, the highest rated TV show in U.S. history could be the upcoming presidential debates. Do you expect that that will be the make or break for this election? Well, I think there's a confluence of a few things taking place in this election. One is, is that we have a reality president and a reality television show, a reality presidential candidate, excuse me. Someone who's won the Republican nomination, almost as if it's a reality TV show. And we know that reality TV shows have such great ratings because they're unscripted, they can be vulgar, they can be impulsive, they can be insulting. And I think we've seen a lot of that in this election and they're campaign. unscripted completely. I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen. Right. But the problem with reality shows is we don't see what happens after the rea reality. After you win the bachelorette contest and you get married. Or after you win the apprentice and actually work. Or actually you win the uh, American Idol and you are a, a singer touring around. So we don't see the really day-to-day -day thing. We see the process of being chosen for that, but we don't see what happens. So the, the impulsiveness, the unscriptedness, and even sometimes the obnoxiousness that we see in reality TV shows that we love to see. Jersey Shore, even this has become like an election uh, that has MTV elements to it even. So what does it stand for and what's going to happen? So the people are, are looking at the debates now as you know, almost a clash of the verbal titans, if you will, where Donald Trump, how much can he insult you know, Hillary Clinton and how much can he bash her? And Hillary Clinton, how is she going to handle those attacks? And I think if she'll be able to handle him and actually give some back to him, then uh, she has a, a very good chance of, of solidifying her base and getting people to vote for her. Mitchell Barak, thanks so much for being with us on ILTV. The Palestinian High Court in the West Bank has decided against holding municipal elections on October 8th, elections which would have been the first democratic exercise in the Palestinian territories over the last 10 years. Well, this is a court uh, decision. It's too early to, uh, to discuss the details about it. But yes, uh, I can confirm that there was a court decision to, um, you know, to freeze the process. But that doesn't mean it's the end of the process itself. And then the court will continue and then come up uh, with further findings when they have the second hearing. <laughs> Thursday's court ruling comes after a major dispute over party lists and several polls suggesting that Hamas would win elections against Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas's ruling party Fatah. Hamas has submitted challenges against party lists drawn up by Fatah to the court in Ramallah and the disagreement highlights the legal and political divisions between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. The upcoming elections have been viewed as a proxy vote on the popularity of President Abbas and his Fatah party versus a Gaza Strip ruling Islamist group. And now that they're canceled, many Palestinians feel cheated of their voice in local political affairs. <laughs> The the vote would have been the first involving Hamas and Fatah since 2006, when Hamas won a surprise victory in legislative polls. The outcome led to a devastating rupture in Palestinian politics and lay the groundwork for the current standoff between the two groups. The court in Ramallah will hold another session to consider the issue on September 21st, but legal experts claim the decision is unlikely to be reversed, meaning it's almost certain that municipal elections will not be held. Yet lots of young Palestinians believe new elections are the key to a brighter future in the Palestinian territories. <laughs> The 
واحنا كنا متلهفين لهي الانتخابات عشان نشوف مين الاجدر انه يستحق مركز احسن وتطوير احسن للبلد Some polls show that if parliamentary elections were held tomorrow, Hamas would win in both Gaza and the West Bank. Current Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is 81 years old and has been leading for 11 years. And the Western-backed Palestinian leader has become unpopular even though he has no clear successor. No move towards holding new presidential elections has been made either. And while local elections were held in 2012, voting only took place in a fraction of the West Bank's 350 municipalities. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Everything begins with an idea, so today's word is rayon, which means idea in Hebrew. A simple rayon can inspire, motivate, and produce change. And here in Israel, everybody knows that good rayonot, or ideas, can change the course of history. That's probably why so many innovative startups are created in the Holy Land, and so many groundbreaking discoveries are made on a daily basis. An absolutely new rayon may be one of the rarest things known to humankind, but the truth is that it's a lot harder to escape from old ideas than it is to create new ones. After all, no one ever discovered anything new by coloring in the lines. So try opening your mind because as they say, a good idea is salvation by imagination. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. It's the beginning of a new week. Monday is expected to be sunny with a high of 87 degrees. Tuesday should be just as sunny, but the temperature should go down to 86. All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.76 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to check out our next update at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching, and see you tonight.